Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we've got a great show. Jordan Bitts is a young engineer from Boise, Idaho, and man, did he step into it with audio over IP. He's learning all about it. He's going to teach us a couple things about what he's doing there. Plus, David Bialik joins us and tells us what's coming up at the AES convention in New York City. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide and the Vivid Voice Sale. Choose from five professional voiceover packages designed by Joe Cipriano. By the Telos VX, VOIP talk show system, now used by local and network television broadcasters to streamline workflows and provide perfect communication with remote crews. And by the new Ruby console from Lavo, with AutoMix smart mixing and a context-sensitive user interface. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash work. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. This is the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And on this week's show, we've got a lot of bits to talk about. <laughs> bits and bites. And that's a really bad pun. We'll bring him in in just a minute. Jordan Bits is going to join us here in just a second. Talking about audio over IP and redundancy and uh, and how to make this work in a in a small to medium-sized market. Because, uh, I don't know, pressures may be different there. Maybe it's easier in some ways. But in other ways, you may not have the, as much money to spend. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what Jordan has to say about it. Uh, again, as I said, I'm Kirk Harnack. I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. So that's my bias. Um, and uh, we just have a good time on the show. We talk about all things technical that have to do with radio broadcasting and, and internet streaming and just have a great time. So let's bring in our, uh, our, our, our my, my co-host, my loyal co-host, Chris Tobin. And he's at some <laughs> transmitter site. Chris, where are you? Can, you? can you say or can you not say? Yeah, yeah I, I'm at my transmitter site here at uh, Times Square uh, doing some work on, the, on a router, router, depending on which part of the world you're in. And uh, some SCA stuff. So just routine maintenance. It's the end of the month or actually the start of the new month. So just checking on things. That's how I get to sleep at night and travel without worries. So you're at, at that site that's right at this, what, the, the south end of Times Square, right? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just down the block okay. from Father Duffy. Well, you, you said Times Square. So I. It is. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That is an awesome site. And thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's you that got me in there or who, but, you know, we all, we all did a tour of that place some years ago. Uh, with John Lyons oh, that, giving, giving the well, tour. John Lyons would have been the person that got you in. He manages yeah. all the rooftops at Durst and uh, manages this site and uh, One World Trade Center. It may have been a um, uh, an SBE meeting. I'm not sure, but somehow. And, and even my, you know, my wife was along. And we uh, on the rooftop, we actually saw a movie being filmed. And we saw a famous person up there. My wife just about, <laughs> just about lost it. Said, Honey, be cool. Act cool. <laughs> it's okay. Act cool. <laughs> there, there have been several several movies and TV series shot here at the building, uh, on the floors down below and on the rooftop, and it's it's actually pretty funny when you you're coming in just to do routine work and you see these three phase wire lines for lighting for movie lighting through the hallway and into the into the room where you're working and you go that's the electrical panel that serves my room that has clamp ons. Okay, Ooh. this should be fun. Let me go upstairs <laughs> and see what's going on. And uh, it, it's it's. No, they do a great job. Trust me, the building engineering team here at Four Times Square, they do a great job of keeping things isolated and properly maintained. But it's just, yeah, you walk in like, oh, there's a movie being shot. This is great. Go up on the rooftop, and it's just a full crew. <laughs> and it's the wildest thing. They, they, they've built a platform that's literally at the roof's edge. I mean, they have a Ooh. railing around it. They have a yeah. railing and stuff, but it's so funny to see the crew and, and do stuff. It's, it's, it's great. And then you're riding the elevator with folks. You go, wait a minute. Aren't you the lead in Quantico? Yes, you are. That's that lady. How about that? Or, or you know, it's like, wait a minute, is that your name, Kevin Spacey? No, I got somebody. I got it wrong, right? You're not the guy. Hey, it's just you, you got to love it. We we live in a in a world of celebrities here here in Nashville. I'm going to a meeting tonight, and uh, honest to goodness, probably Cheryl Crow is going to be there because nice. she participated. Yeah, but not not as Cheryl Crow. I mean, not as the not as the singer, but just as a mom. So. There, you know, gives gives everybody gives her space and lets her be a mom. Hey, uh, okay, um, let's jump right into it. Jordan Bits is here, and I met Jordan on Facebook. Facebook's great; you meet the coolest people. And so, uh, I met Jordan on Facebook, and he's here. Jordan, welcome in. Tell us, uh, tell us about yourself. Give us the elevator speech about Jordan Bits. Well, it's good to be here, Kirk. I am in Boise, Idaho. I am the chief engineer for Barefoot Media Ministries. We have three regional radio networks around Idaho and Oregon based out of Boise and Twin Falls, uh, two wow. studio locations, and I take care of all of it. 
And all of our sites, with the exception of Twin Falls and a few off-air fed translators, are all fed with IP and receive audio over IP. Awesome. And, and so what, we'll get into this more later, but I want to know about, you know, what, what audio over IP do you have in the studios themselves? And then what kind of audio over IP goes out and comes back in? And how do you get your signal to all these, these studios? And, uh, I mean, there's uh, transmitter sites, and that's, that's going to be pretty fascinating. So, Jordan, I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking about it. And, it's, frankly, it's great to have somebody young on the show. Because, you know, me and Chris, we're really old. <laughs> it's, it's really good to have, have some young blood and people who understand, uh, you know, IT and, and just the, that whole world. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Hey, we're going we're gonna to move through the show pretty quickly today because we've also got an interview with David Bialik uh, to air. That'll be uh, after our second break. And David's going to tell us what's going on at AES in New York. That's pretty cool. In fact, we were talking about John Lyons a few minutes ago. John Lyons is mentioned in the interview. Also, Chris Tobin gets mentioned. I'm in there too. And and a lot of other, uh, it, well, names you know if you're in engineering uh, are in the David Bialik interview talking about what's coming up in a few weeks in New York at the Javits Center at the AES. And we're really encouraging you. If any way you can go, go. And we'll have a, a, um, a link in the show notes for your free expo pass. So because you're a viewer or listener to this show, uh, you can go to the expo, uh, the AES expo for free. Can't get you in the sessions for free. That does cost money. But there, there's the expo, and then there's a couple of events that go along with that. Uh, so uh, that'll be in the show notes. All right. This show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcast Supply Worldwide. And they are having a new sale. It's called Save and Be Heard. You save up to 61% during their Vivid Voice sale. Get the gear you need to come through loud and clear at great low prices. So let's look at what they've got. First of all, on the web page here, we'll, and we'll put a link to that in, in, the, in the notes, it's a voiceover package. And this is, you can see it's it's signed and it's got Joe Cipriano's picture on it. Yes, he endorses this package. We've had Joe Cipriano on the show before. This guy knows what he's doing with voiceover. You can save big on exclusive packages created by Joe and BSW. There are five packages to choose from. You need to go to this web page and click learn more. Now, we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, if you want me to give you the website, uh, I'll, I'll give you the link. It's, well, uh, it, yeah, clicking on the show notes is going to be easier, but it's bswusa.com slash vividvoicesale.aspx. Okay, I know that's a lot. So why don't you wait for it to come out in the show notes? And then you can click on it and uh, and learn more about the different packages that are available. Plus, there's other packages available, too. There's the hot processor package, and you get a free Electrovoice RE20 mic. That's a $765 value. When you buy Orban's Optimod 5500i, that's a five-band FM broadcast processor offering low-latency analog and digital I.O., a full-featured RDS, RBDS generator, and more. You get that for $3,690. And you get the mic, the Electrovoice RE20 for free. You get a $200 uh, instant rebate on the 8-channel AudioArts Air 1 console. That features premium mic preamps, dual program buses, and a USB audio port for convenient interfacing with computers and automation systems. Uh, it's only $17.99 when you use the promo code AA1, as in Audio Arts or no, Audio Arts Air One AA Two A's and the number one and get your two hundred dollar instant rebate. Other things too, mic packs are on sale like the Electro Voice uh, RE Three Twenty, offering superb detail and dual voicing switch for real flexibility, limited time. It's just two ninety nine. Yeah, glad they have in ear monitors. The ultimate. Oh, I love these monitors. I always feel like I can't afford them, but I used to have some and lost them. I need to get some more Ultimate Ears UE4 Pro in-ear monitor. These are amazing. These aren't just earbuds. These are actual in-ear monitors. The UE Pro 4 gives you great sound quality, wide frequency response, strong ambient noise isolation, and a very perfect custom fit. Contact BSW for your special low price. Uh, a couple of other items, just the HDV mixer. You can uh, put video on your on your website along with your audio, do special events, live remotes, ball games, and all that kind of stuff. HDV Mixer is exclusively at bswusa.com. And finally, the Comrex Opal IP Audio Gateway. You need to check this thing out. It's got a lot of cool features, letting you easily transmit HD high-quality audio and bring in VIP guests. Just send them a link. They click the link on their phone, Android, or iOS, as long as it's iOS 11, 
and you get great audio from them back to your studio for great interviews. Check it out. The, um, the Vivid Voice Sale at bswusa.com. Uh, you can hunt around the website, or uh, I'll stick the uh, link in the show notes, and you can see it there. Thanks a lot to bswusa.com for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Remember, if you order by 9 p.m., 9 p. No, by, I'm sorry, by 7 p.m. Eastern. Order by 7 p.m. Eastern, and they can ship it out the same day if it's in their warehouse because they're right down the street from uh, UPS in a big old airport. All right, let's jump right into it. Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin, and Jordan Bits are all here, and we're going to talk about uh, Jordan's experience with audio over IP. And Jordan, you and I really haven't had much of a chance to talk, so I want to know, you know, what's on your mind, what's on your heart that you want to share with our audience about audio over IP? What have you discovered? What's important to you? And what do you think needs to be, get told? Well, the, the station I'm at now is my first encounter with, with an Axia system, with Axia boards. I've never touched those before. Uh, when I, I'm originally from North Dakota. I uh, never, never touched Axia before. So I walked in into, into a station that was, was all IP, and it was baptism by fire. I, I was thrown, thrown right into the pit. Uh, Ten-year-old oh, equipment, and Axia is great. Axia is great. It's very robust, uh, but like, like everything else, it does get old, and it does start to, does start to show its age at well, times. This is 10-year-old Axia gear? Roughly, from what I understand. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, un, until recently, the mix engines uh, driving our element boards were 10 years old. Roughly. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're the original mix engines. Okay. About time for batteries. The original mix engines with... Yeah, with the with the, you open it up and there's a composite output on the motherboard. Yeah, and yeah. five hundred and twelve meg, megs of RAM. But yeah, we're okay. running. Well, we're we're all IP. We we have all Axia. All of our distribution is is Zip One. Uh, we have a Livewire STL in Boise. If you if you listen to any of our signals, the audio you're hearing was at one point IP. Mm-hmm. Everything's digital until the transmitter. Now, you said you've got a live wire STL. We've talked about some of those ways to do that here on the show. Uh, what are you doing there in Boise to get live wire to a transmitter site? We're using, I believe it's on 11 gigahertz, an 11 gigahertz license link from our studio in Caldwell, which is a suburb of Boise on the far western edge of the Treasure Valley. And our studios are on the eastern edge at a place called Deer Point above a ski resort. And we're shooting probably 30 miles across the valley, two channels, uncompressed, live wire standard streams to drive our radio stations. 30 miles? Yeah. Holy, holy cow. Uh, Chris, <laughs> this is impressive. Okay, because I've got, uh, in Mississippi, I've got a link that's six miles with a couple of ubiquity boxes. They're unlicensed. And I've got a 13-mile link that I wish was six nines of reliability it's probably five because we do go off the air occasionally due to really really bad layering of the atmosphere and water and stuff but 30 miles chris have you heard of 30 mile hop with uh, live wire with live wire no but 30 mile hops i have heard of uh, with data and audio or sure. audio in the form of data what size um uh, antenna what's the dish size on both ends of the link the diameter uh, we're using six foot trango dishes Ah, ah, wow. Tango. And what's your Man. fade margin? How, how much room do you have to work with? I've got, got about half a gig. Hmm. Okay. I, uh, the, the, link, the, link, the link is shared with, uh, with a wireless internet company who set this up for us. So they use it for backhaul. They have a tower behind our studio as a distribution point. So they feed all their backhaul to that tower over that link as well, in addition to my... My two, uh, my two networks that I run over it. Okay, so this is okay. this is this is interesting because, and we were talking about this just before the show. And I want for Jordan, if you would, to explain this um, to the best of, of his ability. And I, I'm really, I wanted to explain it to me because this is what I want to do on my ubiquity uh, 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 IP radio links. Right now, I'm using them exclusively for live wire because I don't want. I don't want my lack of knowledge in how to divvy up the bandwidth using routers or whatever it is that I need at one end or both ends. I'd like to run my business network out to the, each of the, my transmitter sites as well, but I don't want to take any chance of that business network 
interfering, uh, you know, taking up too much bandwidth. If something's wanting to suck a bunch of bandwidth, how? So, jo uh, Jordan, how do I make this work? Because right now my IP radios are only on my Axia network. That's it. They don't touch my business network, and they have two totally different uh, IP ranges. And I'm not using any VLANing right now. They're physically separate networks. What would I need to do? to combine both networks so they don't see each other, don't bother each other. And so I'm always guaranteed the bandwidth that I want on my Axia network. Where do I start? We're using Ubiquiti edge routers. They're the rack mount units. We have one at the studio, one at the transmitter site, and we're using them to pass two VLANs over that link. So we have the first VLAN, excuse me, the first VLAN handles all of our, all of our data. So telemetry, uh, Burke's IP cameras, uh, the web interfaces for the transmitters, all of that on on one network, totally separate. And the other VLAN handles handles Axie, and we're able to use our IT contractor is is an absolute wizard. And him and I were able to set up QoS to where they don't touch each other. So we have the two networks that run point to point. In addition to that, I also have outgoing zip feeds to our remote sites on that and the wireless internet company uses that for their own backhaul and we're using that with again the ubiquity units on our side but then it runs through a couple microtech and some natonics boxes at the studio and transmitter site to kind of orchestrate all the magic that happens there what's okay. the rf levels the rf levels on both ends what do you have for signal strength rssi how are things looking uh, I don't there know. what I actually don't have access to the radios, unfortunately. I, I wish I did. I'm kind of a control freak, but that that's all the wireless internet company, and they, they won't let me touch it. Believe me, I've asked. Okay. Oh, no, no, I, I'm sure. I, I, I just after working this summer on some microwave linking, uh, the one thing I discovered, no matter what I did for the network side of you know, uh, provisioning, if you will, if the RF link wasn't close to where you need it to be for solid you know, five nines, four nines, or even six, you, mm -hmm. you, everything else you do, the VLANs, yeah, you know, they just fall apart. So I'm just curious. Thirty miles, you must you must have a pretty good RF signal, you know, Fresnel zone clearance, and everything else. Because if you're carrying that kind of traffic, oh, yeah. uh, that's that's damn good. Yeah, we have you know we're 7,500 feet above sea level on the transmitter side at the mountain top, and then the studio side is up on a hill too, 30 miles away. So we've got great Fresnel, great line of sight. There's no obstructions at all. So okay. Jordan. That's uh, was this um, uh, system, this IP radio carrying, well, it sounds like you're carrying essentially three different networks on the Axia and your business network, and then the ISP is carrying their own networking on that. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So there's three different networks on there. They're, they're, each, they're each VLAN, and using the proper routers, they're, um, you, you're, you, you get the guaranteed bandwidth you need for, for your audio stuff that that's not interfered with. Um, what, was this in place before you got there, or did you help set this up? I helped set it up. I helped set up the Axia side. The tower and the link was already in place. Mm -hmm. But I, okay. I helped set up the VLANs for uh, for the zip feeds, the public IP, no, not the public IP, the office side and the Axia side. Now, now I know there, there are people watching this show. In fact, I just got a message uh, from a friend uh, over in Europe. I, 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 there are people watching the show for whom, okay, Kirk, don't be so surprised. This is old hat stuff. This is standard networking. So I'm excited because, look, I, I don't entirely get it. I, I get basic stuff, but uh, this is a project that I haven't done yet, so I don't totally understand it yet. And I know there's got to be other engineers out there that are in my shoes that don't totally understand this, what they can do with it. And, and that's why I'm I'm really asking you about okay, what equipment do you have, and and where where does the 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 choke or the or the the, the you know bandwidth uh, limiting take place in the system? So this is good information, and I appreciate it. And for those of you who know how to do this, <laughs> bear with me, okay? Because <laughs> so, I'm 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 eager to learn. Um, so uh, Jordan, this system has been pretty reliable, but you also have uh, you've been interested in in a backup system, right? Yeah. It as in everything, it's not perfect. We've had issues with it. It's, uh, again, driven by an ISP. They maintain it. So there there are times where they'll do a reboot and I'll, I'll lose my audio somewhere down the chain or power over Ethernet injectors will fail. Trango radios, for whatever reason, like to eat their power over Ethernet injector about once every three months, usually at 3 mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning. Oh. And that, that causes it. Yeah, 
and that causes everything to tank. So having, even though you, you think you have the perfect system, it sounds great, uptime is fantastic. You still want to have a backup to go to just in case, whether it's an old 950 system or you pipe in uh, DSL or broadband or fiber to the transmitter site as a failover. So at, at this transmitter site, do you have any other options or is IP radio the only link up there? As of right now, we have two radio stations, uh, 89.5 KTSY, which is the Heritage Contemporary Christian Station in the market. That has a 950 megahertz backup link that we ran on until the, the Axial link came live. But our sister station, Project 88.7 Positive Hip Hop, well, if the link goes down, we're toast. Mm. We have half, half redundancy. So I have a Zip1 at the studio, Zip1 at the transmitter, the zip one at the studio leaves on a CenturyLink connection, but it still comes in on the same core router that the ISP uses to receive R2 VLANs. Comes in on a different radio, but it's still on the same router and on the same backbone. So if I lose that router, or if they lose a radio, I'm I'm dead. Gotcha. Yeah, on, so on that Friday, one. Yeah. yeah. So Friday, I, I actually have another internet service provider in town hooking me up with their service, uh, just a 10 meg connection as a backup. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not totally SOL. Chris, I, I don't know what you can do in, in New York City, but hey, at my little stations in Mississippi, I mean, our backup is our internet stream, and at least we've got something. And sure, the internet stream is uh, high efficiency AAC V2 at 48 kilobits. I wouldn't want to listen to it for days on end, but if the IP radio system dies, we can we can get on the air. Would, would, would that cut the mustard in, in New York City or what, Chris? Well, no, not exactly. It wouldn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can assure you the folks here in New York City definitely have to find uh, several ways of keeping things uh, moving along. Uh, I, we have T1s that are still in use in the, in the city. A lot of folks mm. are using wireless linking, both 950, 5.8, 11 gigs, 23 gigs. Uh, there's a few things going on. So, yeah, you have choices. And you just have to manage it and build it out the way you know best and there's always there always has to be some kind of failover and at the end if all else falls apart connection wise i'm pretty sure everybody here in the city has some form of local audio generation at at the transmitter room to get keep audio going and music playing and everybody is uh happy while the folks like us in the background are, are crazily running around <laughs> trying to get things reconnected Hey, as long as you're talking about that uh, audio at the transmitter site, what's what's a common method that's in, in use there? What piece of gear can easily uh, give you some backup audio? Well, I know some folks use their uh, an automation system the server. You know, it just hmm. mirror, mirrors what they have at the studio. I have seen and uh, use the Denon solid state player. It's an SD card, and you know that you play back from. Uh, yeah. That's a good safety. Um, what else? That's pretty much. Those are the, you know, and everybody has their own little way of doing this many ways to do it. some people still have cd players with a little trigger on it and, and nowadays I, guess, I, think, I think most points automation obviously the uh the automation system is fully remote controllable you know by ip by, by browsing into it or by by, by uh, screen sharing but uh the the, the denon you can start it with a start and stop it with contact closures uh yeah you can't really can't really use an ipod that way uh because you, there's uh, no. there's no no remote control for it okay okay yeah right. no, i've seen i actually i remember talking to someone who tried using an ipod as a backup source and i think the problem they ran into is the charger wouldn't charge well enough and the battery would die so it mm. didn't, didn't work out well <laughs> so uh jordan uh you also wanted to kind of fill us in on on your thoughts about uh, uh redundancy and backup maybe as it has to do with uh doing live remote broadcasts or getting your audio to other places where it, it needs to go uh, i think you mentioned uh, an, an an lptv or something but Kind of give us your thoughts about redundancy backup and what methodologies you're using for that. So we send our, our two stations to an LPTV station here in the Valley. Uh, right now, our main method of getting audio to them is some little diva boxes at the studio that receive audio from a private shoutcast server I have at the station. Now, that actually leaves the building on the same link that the Axia network leaves the building on to get up to the transmitter. Well, when that fails, the Diva boxes have been programmed to fail over to our public web stream through Christian Netcast. And then when that fails, if we lose, because the, the Christian Netcast stream is on a separate internet connection at the station. So I've got two mm. paths out to the TV station. 
But if something goes down there, we have a couple cheap rack mount tuners that we can plug into the encoder and have audio on TV as well. Because you'd, you'd be oh. amazed at how many people listen to us through the TV because it's right there in their living room and they don't have to have an app, they don't have to have another device. And a lot of people don't have FM tuners in their, in their living rooms anymore. Oh yeah, you're right. So are, are these LPFMs, are they carried on the cable? No, just over the air. Just over the air. Okay. Okay. So people would have to have an external an, an, an antenna to pick up uh, TV over the air. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, mm -hmm. LP TVs are, are, are these guys uh, HD now? You know, are are they digital DTV nowadays, or are they still analog? Oh yeah, we're digital. Uh, I, I freelance okay. for them on the side, and they they're pushing uh, all eight channels. So they're digital, but they're not HD. Gotcha. They're used to doing eight video mm -hmm. channels on one TV channel. Okay, hey, we got a couple of those here in Nashville too. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also push I, I, uh, digital signage to them as well. Oh, okay. For promotions okay. and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the digital signage. What, what's the end device on that? What what's receiving the data and turning that into signage? It's a Dell box at the studio at the TV studio running G Photo Show. Oh, okay. So we we just okay. push. Yep. We just push all of our all of our graphics to them. It plays out there. No headache on our end. Now, Jordan, did I, did I understand that you guys are doing remote broadcasts using audio over IP in, in some way? Oh yeah, that's the only way we do a remote. We have we have three boxes, three kits that have zips, wireless mics, and line mixers all built in one box. Throw it in the suburban, go wherever, and we're on the air. Uh, we we don't use Marty's. We will we will use Skype if we have to, or we'll we'll phone in or send an MP3 in if we have to. But it's all zip, and the reliability is amazing with a Verizon hotspot. In fact, tomorrow morning we're doing a, a promotion where we drive around with the zip in the station vehicle and pay for people at drive-throughs during the morning show, <laughs> and we control everything remotely. No, yeah. So, so you're using a Verizon what like a little MiFi box, yeah? It looks like a wireless router. It's got it's got a built-in switch. It's got you can plug a landline phone into it, and it oh, okay. just sits okay. there. Velcro's onto the top of the case, plugs the the zip plugs in over Ethernet, laptop plugs in over Ethernet, and the whole morning show is driven from the car. Okay, so you're you're getting uh, wired. You don't have to rely on Wi-Fi either to the zip ones or anything else. You that little router that from Verizon mm -hmm. gives you wired connections. Mm hmm. Yep. Very cool. And and the bandwidth, uh, the 4G bandwidth is, is adequate to do what you need to do, huh? For 24K uh, AAC, yeah, it's fine. Ah, okay, okay. Cool. And, mm -hmm. and you're controlling the automation back in the studio, so the only thing that's actually going over a lower bitrate AAC is, are, are the talent voices at, at, the, at the remote, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so wow. the morning show sitting up front, uh, they're driving. I'm just in the back seat with a laptop and a Zip1 next to me. Wait, running they're driving. everything you remotely. Mean, this is going on while you're driving? Yep. <laughs> That's great. We used to dream about doing remotes while we were driving, but, you know, pointing the Marty antenna out the window, <laughs> keeping it aimed at the right oh. place. <laughs> oh, gosh. Chris, when's the last time you did a remote while you're driving? Ooh, while I was driving. <laughs> uh, hasn't been recent, but I have done many. I have done many both with Marty Verizon uh, LTE capabilities, uh, also with uh, three at the time at the time analog cell phones in a car with the CN Rude box, which was the equivalent to a Comrex or a Getner phone line extender. Yeah, so you could picture three cell phones being linked together <laughs> in the form of like you would do with a Comrex box, oh, going back to a network operations center, then fetting out to affiliates across the country while driving on the Long Island Expressway at uh, <laughs> 55 miles an hour. Covering a story, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was that was a challenge. I will admit that was it was interesting listening the guys back at the other end trying to keep the three lines synced and uh, going through a cell site. It was pretty wild. We've come a long way. <laughs> we, well, in some ways we have, in some ways yeah, it's still kind of the same stuff. Jordan, that's yeah. the, that's now, whose harebrained idea was it in programming to do remotes while you're driving down the road? Those are the best. I I think it was our general managers. <laughs> They've they've been doing it lo long before I started, but it 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 it, it just happens, and we're kind of known for it. We pass <laughs> out when we go to a drive-through. We 
ask that the person behind the window hand them a little card that says, what just happened to them, and a bumper sticker. Uh Uh-huh. Cool. Yeah, we, okay. it's okay. Live, live radio behind the wheel of a 2002 Chevy <laughs> Suburban with a Zip 1 Verizon hotspot and an engineer in the back seat. Oh, my gosh. I and love it. Distractive, uh, distractive driving laws don't exist in Boise. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not, no. <laughs> so, wait, no, you mean the, the, the driver has the microphone? Yep. Headset mic, I hope. <laughs> yep. Uh, Depends okay. on the day. <laughs> I love it, uh, Jordan. Before we have to go to break, uh, w- w- any any amazing stories uh, that you care to tell? Anything? Any engineering daring do that you'd like to pass along to us? The that has to do with audio over IP. Oh man! Uh, Not that the remotes and the moving vehicle, the moving suburban, yeah. aren't enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 just trying to think. Uh, what was what was I, that that, I, I what did, was that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I did make. Uh, I did manage to make an old gateway desktop perform the duty of an Axia DSP mix engine last winter. What? Would you have something break? Yeah. And you had to do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. At uh, about three o'clock in the morning, I get off air alarms that both of our stations were off the air, so I, I drive in, and the engine's dead. That drives the whole the whole show, including okay, our main the, studio for the morning show. It's all, the audio over IP mixing engine that probably has the name Axie on it in a silver box. It's ten years old. Okay, yeah, was was, was dead. So I, I'm already get. I was already on my way out the door to go to a remote mountaintop site to fix a transmitter. Our morning show guy comes in. I send him home to track. I get back from the mountain. And I, I, I got creative, started pulling old PCs out of the junk drawer, out of the drunk bo- junk box, and found a gateway that had the right IDE header inside and the right network chipset that Axia likes, mm. put the little boot card in, and I was running my board on an old gateway desktop. <laughs> How about that? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That, that's creative. You, you, get the it, gold star, you got the gold star that morning, didn't you? It got me on the air until I was able to get a replacement engine. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Hey, um, yeah. If uh, l- listeners, viewers, this is uh, this week in radio tech that you are tuned into. It's episode three sixty seven. I'm Kirk Harnack along with uh, Chris Tobin, and we're talking with Jordan Bits. He's an engineer in Boise, Idaho. And uh, Jordan, again, the name of the of the station group. Uh, we're Barefoot Media Ministries. We have three small regional networks out of Boise and Twin Falls. We cover Boise, obviously, McCall, Idaho, Baker City, Oregon, Sun Valley, Idaho, Twin Falls, Idaho, and Idaho Falls, Idaho. Wow. That's a lot to remember. Good job. Yep. Uh, we're going to be back with Jordan in a few minutes. And and uh, Jordan and Chris will both have an amazing tip of the week uh, that, that you can walk away with and put to use and uh, you know Im- impress your boss and, and all that. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up. Also, David Bialik is coming up right after the break. And our show is brought to you in part by our friends at the Telos Alliance. And I got to tell you, just two days ago, uh, Tuesday, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. And you're going to see a video about, actually, you can see a couple of videos about this. But I want to talk to you if, uh, well, I know we don't have a lot of TV engineer viewers on this show because this is a show about radio. But here's a very cool idea, and it's working really well. The Telos VX, you know, that's a multi-line, multi-studio, voice over IP, uh, SIP protocol uh, phone system. Well, it's finding a real home at TV stations. Why? Well, take a big station like WSB TV in Atlanta, where they have a dozen remote trucks. Each truck has a crew of at least a reporter, but usually a reporter, a photog, and sometimes a truck operator. You know, if, if they're going to put the mast up, if they're going to aim the satellite dish, uh, then they're you know anything besides a, you know a live view unit, they're going to have an operator to run things and make sure it stays safe. Well, and and the signal's good. Well, with all these people involved, and hey, think about this, you know, for a, a two and a half hour news block they have in the evenings, uh, they might have all 12 trucks out there and they could very well have anywhere from 24 to 36 people in the field 
who need to hear IFB. They need to hear in their ear. They need to get their cues. They can't get them off the air because there's too much delay in the over-the-air signal by the time it goes through all the digital stuff it's got to go through. They need to hear through their cell phone, which you know has a minimal amount of delay. Uh, they need to get their cueing. They need to. They need to hear. Hey, we're coming to you. Hey, send us your package. Uh, hey, is there is there is there a voiceover in this? Is there a VO? Are we going to start? You know, all the instructions from the producer of each newscast out to the remote site and from the remote site coming back in. So, to listen to all this, what do the remote the the remote operators, remote talent, photogs, reporters, truck operators, what do they need to do? Well, the the convenient thing is they use their cell phone. They plug their little IFB uh, earpiece into the cell phone, and then they just dial a number. And it is just amazing the way this is set up. They dial it. They dial in a number, and it's answered by an asterisk uh, VoIP PBX that <laughs> that somebody from from Telos set up for them. And the asterisk speaks back to the reporter what um, basically what intercom channel that they're on, and uh, then. It makes this known also by a visual display to the producer, and and the, and there is a remote producer who ties basically. Well, I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically, the producer presses a button on his or her intercom panel and talks to any truck he or she wants to, talks to all the reporters or all the photogs if if they want to, um, can you know has the complete flexibility to talk to who they need to talk to. Uh, to make sure that these live TV remotes happen. And sure, they've been doing this this kind of thing for years using POTS lines at 40 to 80 bucks per line per month or uh, and, and, and uh, a rack full and literally a, a, a desktop to ceiling rack full of <clears throat> card cages with um, auto answer couplers. Of course, they used to be on a big wall and take up many, take up a couple hundred square feet of floor of uh, wall space. Uh, now, it, it, I mean, it's been in, in, in a rack for a while. Now it's down to literally about six rack spaces, and that's including the redundancy. A Telus VX phone system makes all this possible by putting this by putting the uh, the voice over IP for callers, the, the 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 automatic, you know, the the callers when they call in, uh, the the reporters puts them into the intercom system through the Telus VX and groups them in ways that make perfect sense for the producer to talk back to the reporters, the truck operators, and the photogs. And it's just amazing the way all this works. I got to see it on Tuesday. Again, we'll have a we'll have a video about it. Uh, it's it's a it's you know it's, again it's more oriented towards TV. But if you've got hey we at Telos we get calls from uh, broadcast radio broadcasters around the world who also do complicated setups. And this is one this is a, just it's another thing that the Telos VX system can do. Uh, hey, it sounds like overkill for your radio station. Well, there's also the VX Prime. The VX Prime is a less expensive Telus VX. It's limited in the number of studios that it can handle and the number of, of uh, people you can put on the air at the same time, but it's also less expensive. So if you want to get into the world of voice over IP, SIP, save yourself a ton of money, and literally you can save upwards of 90% on your phone bill. Are you spending what? 1500 a month, 2000 a month on your call in lines? How'd you like to get that down to one or two or maybe $300 a month? Uh, Hey, at, at WSB, they were, they were down in the $300 a month range, still getting a uh, PRI uh, into their asterisk system. Uh, actually, I think they were converting that into IP. Um, point is this is where it's at. The return on investment is there, whether you're radio or television, the return on investment is there. Uh, Check with your, your favorite Telos dealer about the Telos VX or the Telos VX Prime, which is a, a, a lower uh, cost version uh, of the VX, and check it out on the website. It's telosalliance.com slash telos slash VX. We'll put that link in the show notes in the sponsor area. You can check it out yourself. I've been a big believer in this technology for years. I'm so glad to see it now moving into the TV realm where people are getting great benefit from it. All right. Thanks a lot to Telos for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, uh, let's see. We're gonna, we got a quick video here uh, with David Bialik. We'll watch it and be back with Jordan Bits and Chris Tobin in just a minute. Welcome back to This Week in Radio Tech. And on this segment, we're here with David Bialik, who is in charge of the broadcast and streaming track 
at uh, it seems like every AES convention. This time, it's in David's backyard. It's in New York City. I'm going to be there. Looking forward to it. And uh, I'll be uh, moderating a, a panel on uh, uh, how to, I don't know, something about studios. It's it's really good. We got some smart people on there. I'm just, you know, kind of hurting the, the, the sheep or the cattle. David, welcome in and tell me what's going on at this AES. Well, thank you, Kirk. Uh, it's over 30 years, by the way, since Ooh. I start, started the track. Uh, at the AES convention, so it has been a while. Obviously, started when you were five. So, gee, yeah, started me young at AES. Um, well, back then, digital was only something to talk about. Yet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we got an amazing track this year. Um, mm -hmm. The convention goes from October 18th through the 21st, um, and if anybody wants to uh, register. Uh, on the website, just use the code um, AES. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's 143 broadcast is the code. Yes. 143 broadcast, and uh, you'll get a free exhibits only uh, pass. But um, I encourage everybody to get the full pass because the sessions uh, that we have are always great. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is if you attend the sessions at the AES convention, that will count towards your SBE certification, recert recertification. Ah, okay. And, and by the uh, way, I'll, I'll put a link to the special page that you provided me in the show notes of This Week in Radio Tech. So if, you, if you're watching the show or listening to the show, go to thisweekinradiotech.com, look at the show notes for this show, and you'll see a link to get yourself registered, and you'll see that that uh, that promo code of 143 broadcast that will get you in the, uh, the expo sessions, uh, the expo itself for free. And then if you want to upgrade to the full pass, you're welcome to do so. Go ahead, Dave. By the way, that mm -hmm. code has to be in uppercase. I found out someone tried it in lowercase and it didn't work. Uh, yeah, exactly as typed on the web page. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we got some amazing sessions. Um, and I'm just going to go down the list right now because that's the best way to do it. Um, we have designing and constructing a radio performance space. But, um, by the way, th th this is the, the start of the show on Wednesday, right? The uh, Wednesday eight at 9 a.m. in the morning. All right. New York time. Um, so Dave Prentice is, uh, from Dale Pro Audio is moderating that. And mm -hmm. he's got panelists, uh, Sam Kappas from CBS Radio, Josh Morris from uh, Walter Storick, Steve Schultes from uh, WNYC New York Public Radio, and Jeff Smith from iHeart Media. And it's going to be really neat. They're going to talk about the different performance spaces they have because – um, having performance spaces in radio is new again. We started out having that in the 30s and 40s and suddenly went away, and now uh, it's back. Everything old is new again. And Sam actually has something real interesting in Chicago. He not only did a performance space for bands, he also did a performance kitchen, which is really cool. <laughs> cool. What's, uh, that, so that starts at 9 a.m. What, what's the next uh, program? The next one it will be audio cable problem solving. Mm. Uh, you, you know, solving a problem with uh, when it's the wire is always an issue, and there's no one better to chair that session than Steve Lampin from yeah. Belden. Yeah. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge, uh, and he's got an incredible panel. Dave Carroll from DCE Electronics, Ed Grogan, Chris Payne from uh, Advanced Systems Group, Brad Pope from Belden, and Tom Sahara from uh, Turner Sports. Uh, and it's going to be interesting. Um, I mean, I know I've been thrown for a loop uh, every once in a while because a cable impedance wasn't the, what it should be and so forth, or you didn't calculate in for that. It's neat. And then after that, mm -hmm. uh, we have Sue Zizza and David Shin, uh, who uh, run the Here Now Festival, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, no, no. Th that. Um, it's a great festival they put together every year, and it's basically audio performance. So they did something really neat this year called uh, Binaural Macbeth. So now they're going to do deconstructing Binaural Macbeth. Everyone in the audience is going to have headphones. They're going to listen uh, uh, as they – talk about th this and how what they did to put the listener in the center of the action the whole time cool really, okay really cool um they have a, a very high quality actors 
And for all us engineers in there, they're going to have William DeFries, who is the vo- vo- the original voice of Bob the Builder. <laughs> That'll be cool. That'll be fun. Uh, What's next? So, all right. So then we have evolving best practices for studio construction and remodeling. Hey, that sounds familiar. Yeah, um, this uh, this uh, guy Kirk Harnack uh, is going to be uh, uh, moderating that, and I'll let him talk about uh, what's going to happen during that session. You know, I, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but we do have an all-star cast. People from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, are going to be there on the panel. People much smarter than I am uh, talking about building and designing studios and rebuilding studios for today's technology. So you don't build a studio necessarily the same way that you did. Uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, even five years ago, because of the technologies that are changing. You can get a lot done, perhaps with a lot less. So, Or maybe you need just as much. There are some, some immutable facts about audio and performance spaces and studio spaces. So that's what we'll be talking about. So enough about me. Well, that's, except it'll be a fantastic session that will close out the afternoon uh, of, of the first day at AES. And Kirk wants everybody in the audience to hold up little signs that say, we listen to you on tour. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> um, What's next? Then right after that, at 730 at night over at One World Trade Center, John Lyons, who basically designed and built the place, mm-hmm. is going to be do- doing a uh, full-blown uh, session and tour of One World Trade Center. Um, he's going to bring some people on. It's going to be very uh, ad lib, which is really great. Um, the audience is going to be limited, um, so you have to be a pre-registered attendee of the convention signed up for this event. But we're taking AES to a new height, like we did two years ago. So, uh, from the highest uh, broadcast facility in the country, uh, we're going to be having that. That sounds amazing, and and it, hey, if if you're if you're registered and and you can, uh, re- how would a how would a, an attendee register for that? Is there a is there you a webpage? Be, you have to be pre-registered. Yeah. On the website, and you have to be pre-registered. I think by today or tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, and and uh, <clears throat> you'll receive an email saying, hey, if you want to go to this, sign up for the lottery, and then there, then we're gonna we have obviously a limited amount of uh tickets because it's not the largest space yeah yeah so um cool all right and obviously we we have security concerns and so so the, uh, the the broadcast track then continues on uh thursday uh, thursday on thursday and th- we start with a case study using the right wire for the right job and once again, when I came up with this topic, I said, who are we going to get? We got Steve to uh, work with uh, Steve Lampin again to work with John Schmidt. And uh, he's a consultant. And they're going to talk about using the right wire for the right job. And and, and, and today, some wires are fairly esoteric. So it, it's important. I like to use Cat 5s, Cat 6 for a lot of stuff, but it's not right for everything. Hey, it's better than what I used to do is use lamp cord for everything. So Steve Lampin will definitely have uh, great advice here. Yeah, it's kind of funny that his name is Lampin. (laughs) (laughs) So what's next? (laughs) Um, Right after that, um, and I invite any broadcaster that wants to come, and you don't need to have any uh, specific badge, but you just need to be registered for the convention. There's going to be a technical committee meeting um, for the Broadcast and Online Delivery uh, Technical Committee, which... I happen to be the chair of that, um, and the subcommittee is for the advanced guidelines for over-the-top uh, television uh, uh, and uh, video services, and they're they're working on putting together um, a guideline for uh, audio loudness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, I. W- I would suggest anyone wanting to get involved with it, that's a great place to start and come in and get your name signed up and so forth. Um, Then, after that, we have audio for advanced video broadcasting. And my good, good friend, going all the way back to college, Fred Willard, I got to moderate this. Mm -hmm. And he, he and I put together a wonderful panel and... This is a long session. It's from 1.30 to 4.15 because you have Robert Blight from Fraunhofer, uh, Stefan Meltzer uh, from Independent Audio Technology, 
um, Andreas Niedermeyer from Fraunhofer, Scott Norcross from Dolby, mm-hmm. Kazoo Ono from NHK, Skip Peasy from NAB, mm-hmm. Pete Wars from Junger, or Younger, I'm sorry, yeah. and uh, Jim Straczynski from NBC. You can't have a better panel than that. That's, for, a, that's an amazing panel. And television audio is so critical, I, I believe, because it, it can make or break your experience watching it it can be really irritating and with it and if it's right then you just don't notice it's just it's right so glad to have this panel and let's face it, it's one of the few audio laws that actually has a law in congress to comment ah, well yeah there's that too there's that too it's okay nice. then after that we have broadcast and streaming media session eight which is the audio considerations for podcast Yes, there are different considerations when making a podcast than doing a stream or when doing a a radio show. And we got moderating this, John Keane, formerly of NPR. Yeah. Another man that's a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So you have Malik Abdullah from NPR. Okay. Dan Jesselson from uh, New York Public Radio. uh, Angela Mandato from Blueberry. And Sam Sousa from Triton Digital. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad Sam will be there. Yeah. Um, it should be a really great panel. As a matter of fact, I've, every day I speak to Sam and I tell him what's going on at the convention, he, he keeps changing his schedule that he can be at the convention more and more days. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, good. Good. And, uh, yeah. and then on fr- uh, Friday, there's going to be a, a, uh, another TC from uh, Broadcast and Online Delivery. Uh, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about um, audio stream loudness and um, also podcast loudness. So okay. I invite everybody to that. And let's see. We have our good friend Steve doing his last session of the convention, which will be advances in microphone cable technology. And he went over this with me, and I said, this is totally different than everything I ever knew. And I said, you have to present this. And that's what we're doing. Um, Then we have another session called podcast production. Because besides the audio considerations, you have to think about how you're actually producing it. And so I got Rob Byers from NPR, Mm -hmm. uh, Rampton, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, (laughs) from uh, NPR, Uh, uh, and we have people from, uh, uh, let's see, uh, we have the the editor from Serial, um, someone from Gimlet, someone from The Truth. Oh, good. This is it's really going to be a high-end uh, session on podcast production. And then uh, you might have said, Dave, you really got some great stars uh, moderating this panel that are really wealth of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Well, guess who I've got moderating this next panel on? Uh, metadata for radio streaming, the digital dashboard. Oh, I, who's that? Who's the one person we know in radio that knows – that you can honestly say knows more than everybody else and is very – subtle about it I, well i can think of well i can think of se- several who aren't so subtle about it <laughs> who do you have in mind who's subtle about it glenn walton oh of course yes he is subtle about it what a gentleman yeah the, the man is <clears throat> a genius and mm-hmm. i got him to moderate this panel and he has he has Stuart buck from arctic palm technology mike engelbrecht from next radio yeah david julian gray from npr and mike raid from dts all talking about this oh perfect and, perfect panel there yeah 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 i and to follow that because as i say <clears throat> this is never enough we have the audio crew of the late show with stephen colbert uh, talking all about how they do the show. <laughs> That'll be neat. Okay. Um, and they're going to come in uh, with pictures and so forth and talk about how they do everything and how it is that they're working in one of the most historic theaters in in the country, if not the world. Uh, I mean, let's face it, Jackie Gleason was there. <laughs> yeah. Ed, Ed Sullivan uh, yeah. did the Ed Sullivan show there. And so, and so many other great things came out of that building. And uh, This crew is phenomenal. And um, I don't know if they won the late show uh, fight this week, but uh, but they, they win late night a lot in the ratings. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I don't know if the SBE certification exams are happening or not. I don't know if, uh, what the registration rate was like. I haven't checked yet. So, um, well, we, 
whether or not they're happening, there's there's plenty going on. Is there any more on the broadcast and streaming track? What? Of course. Oh, okay. And just to make this bigger on the inside, we're doing, what's this? Doctor Who with st- spatial audio. Oh. So this is a, this a performance? N- no. What? This, doc, Doctor Who, uh, the program that's been going on for eons. Yeah. In, I've got uh, Chris Pike from the BBC. Ooh. They pro- they put together a spatial audio episode, and I I was talking with uh, Fred Willer, and I said we've got to get the, them to come to AES and talk about how they're doing it and so forth. Okay. So they're gonna talk about it. We're gonna have the audience all in headphones. Oh so gosh, set up, <clears throat> and I guarantee it's gonna be bigger on the inside. <laughs> The TARDIS effect right there. Right. And (laughs) what better way to end the convention than with an event like that? But there's even something else. All right. We've got to wrap it up. What's what's And I just noticed they did. They left off the page. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) On Friday night. Okay. uh, I'm sorry. It's either Friday night or Saturday night. Uh, You'll have to find out. I'll, I'll provide a link to this to this page where where the broadcast track is. Yeah, it's on Friday night. There's an audio performance at the Dolby Theater. Um, Dolby Lab <clears> has <throat> a small screening room here in New York. Okay. And we're going we're gonna to seat around 100 people, and we're going to have an audio performance. Uh, VoiceScapes is going to be there. Um, I understand someone's going to be performing Mark Twain there and so forth. And they're going to put the picture in the mind in a nice – evening setting so from 7 30 in the evening on uh till uh i think it's till 8 30 or 9 you'll have a nice performance and it, it, it's always good to emphasize with a nice performance how important audio is because just remember when you, when you have tv without the picture you have audio yeah you, yeah and um, but if you have t uh, if you have tv uh, I'm sorry. TV uh, without picture is audio, but if you have TV without the audio, it's surveillance. Yes, it's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah, it's surveillance. That's good. That's so, uh, awesome. Hey, we, we we've got to we got to wrap this up, David. Thank you for your time, and thank you so much, obviously, for putting this amazing track together every year. It's just amazing, especially those after hours things that you do. So I'll provide a link in the show notes to the schedule uh, for this whole broadcast and streaming track at AES. Uh, it's 140, it's 143rd, right? AES. 143rd. Okay. And the reason I do this every year is I remember when I was in college uh, being in, an intern at WAMU FM and also at the National Association of Broadcasters. I was so impressed that these experienced broadcasters would always be there and give me what I needed to learn my craft. And this is my way of giving back every year. Ah, well, good. Well, you certainly do. As I find it really worthwhile myself, I'm looking forward to being there. The all three days, and maybe even the, if there's a fourth day, I'll be there, too. That's, it's four days. Okay, I'll be I there. I don't want to miss Dr. Who, Kirk. You know. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> David, thank you again so much. David Bialik, who uh, puts this thing together for AES, the broadcast and streaming track. Look in the show notes, and I'll have a couple of links right down there. One for registration for the expo and one for the uh, the whole schedule. Yes, David, anything oh, else? Kirk? Um, just that you know, the Wednesday and Thursday of the show are co-located with the New York NAB show. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the nice thing is, if you have a badge for AES, you can go into NAB. Cool. And, and NAB can come into the exhibit hall of AES. All right. Well, the, we'll fill up the Javits Center. Okay. You got it. <laughs> take, it doesn't take, always have to be Comic-Con. <laughs> okay. take, take care, David. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk. We're going to uh, tell you about them in just a second. Stay tuned because we do have our tip of the week coming up from uh, Chris Tobin and from Jordan Bits. I'm curious to see what he has to say for a tip of the week. Lavo dot com, L-A-W-O. They're a German company. Philip Lavo is the CEO. And they make, well, you know what they make. They make these amazing, huge, expensive audio consoles usually for television and they also make a line of consoles for broadcast so if you point your web browser at lavo lawo.com slash twert 
Well, first of all, they'll know that you came to their site because you heard it here. And I really appreciate that. But second of all, I'll take you right to the radio on air section uh, of the products that they make at Lavo the, just for radio broadcasters. And they have uh, several different uh, uh, products that, that are worth your looking at. Uh, one of them, for example, well, radio consoles. They have a line of radio consoles. Now, the, the, these are not the quarter million dollar big consoles that you have at things like the, the World Cup or the Olympics or at, uh, at, at CBC in Canada. No, these are, these, these are reasonably priced radio consoles. Uh, they're very competitive, um, and they they all use well. They're all digital, but they use amazing DSP technology to give you a lot of features in a very small space. And they also have audio over IP, they either included or as an option, uh, like Ravenna, which is AES sixty seven compatible. So you can get a Lavo console, Lavo radio console, and uh, and be assured that you're going to have connectivity with the rest of the AOIP world as we go on forward. Uh, Lava also has been talking about virtual radio for a couple of years now with uh, their crystal clear console. This is a console that um, the part that you touch is a touchscreen, a multi-touch touchscreen. And it runs uh, on this on a beautiful big display, or you can run it on a small display if you like. Uh, but it controls a, a DSP uh, I.O. box uh, that is off somewhere else, wherever, wherever you want to put it, wherever it's convenient to run your mics and your audio ins and outs and, of course, have it hooked to the network. Uh, it, and by the way, it's available with um, with redundant power supplies, too. Lavo is also famous for routing systems, and they make the best in the world. Just great routing systems that uh, are reliable, 24 hours a day, plenty of redundancy built into them. And there's uh, AOIP compatibility built into those as well. Um, the new Ruby console is really amazing. Why? Well, because the Ruby gives you real ease of use from the from the surface itself, from the actual hardware surface. But if you need to go deeper into some of the functions, those are available uh, on the touch screen. And you can really get into uh, setting up beautiful auto mixes, uh, uh, all, just all the features that you want. The mic processing, you can uh, control all that and set that up. Um, also, if you want to have the auto mixing where uh, the host, for example, can take over the conversation and uh, without even touching the console, you can have just a terrific auto mix from the Ruby console. I'd love you to check this out. Uh, Lavo has some great ideas for virtual radio, digital consoles, and AOIP networking using Ravenna. Uh, the website, Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com, and then add the slash twirt, T-W-I-R-T. -T. It'll take you straight to the radio on air page. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right. Uh, I want to see if we can hit up uh, Jordan first on a tip. Jordan, you've had a little while to think about it. What would you like to leave our listeners and viewers with? The one thing that I've always done when I started a new at, start at a new radio station is I set up an in-house IceCast server. It's, it's open source, and you can feed it from your existing streaming PC if the software you're using or the encoder you're using is capable of pushing to multiple destinations. And using this is will will save you if your STL goes down because you can pull it up mm -hmm. on your smartphone, you can pull it up on your iPad, you can pull it up on a laptop, plug it into any audio processor and exciter. And you've got clean audio right there, and it didn't cost you a thing. Wow, good idea, good idea. Uh, I like that. So the I, and and IceCast that's available for several different platforms. You can run that on a Windows machine or or Linux if you like, right? I believe you can also run it on Mac. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, cool. Yep. Good idea and great for confidence. I I have confidence servers myself. I do it a little bit different way. I happen to use uh, Telos. Zipstream software, which has built in uh, HTTP streaming, uh, it's it's actually uh, Shoutcast style streaming. So, but I can tell you, you got a great idea there uh, because it's it's helpful to to uh, to know uh, externally. Hey, I'm a hundred miles away. I'd like to know what's working and what's not. If your confidence stream is working, then at least you know where where that is. And like you said, you can feed your transmitter size with that, not depending on your CDN to get it there and you might have a lot lower delay too and you get to control the bit rate instead of some low bit rate that you might have to do through your cdn yeah you, know, you could do a higher bit rate to feed your transmitter so good idea appreciate it jordan chris tobin what you got for us this week for a tip well it's a simple setup uh, since i've been working on some routers right lately uh, i don't have my cisco cable but a usb to serial everybody familiar with that you should be if you have an rds oh, yeah. uh, fmb80 you could use it on com zero and uh, it's my little 
bag kit. See, it's all in one bag, all set to go. And essentially what I've done is an extension of an S, uh, RS-232 cable and the software for the drivers for the USB to serial adapter, just ah. in case. Mm -hmm. And then you have you say to yourself, well, how do I know if it's working or not? Well, two things. One, don't forget your null modem. You never know when you're going to need that. But you make yourself an RS-232 loopback. Plug it in on the back end of the USB adapter. Go to a hyper terminal oh. or a terminal program, PTTY, buddy. And then you see if you echo back your characters. If you do, you're in great shape. Then you know at least your serial connection is functioning the way it should. The rest is up to the equipment you're plugging into. So that's my little tip. I know it's, it seems archaic, but believe it or not, serial connections are still used in a lot of equipment. I know. And, and I recently did some work at a TV site, and it turns out that two of the encoders for the digital television, they had an option for serial if, you, if the Ethernet port didn't function, you know, whatever happened. Sure enough, I had my cable kit, and it worked. I was able to get in and reset the Ethernet port. Who knew? I, I'm, so, I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, I, in this day of, of, of Ethernet, and Jordan, I don't know about you, but... I'm just not very excited about cereal. To me, cereal is just like, oh. really? Do I have to troubleshoot this? But Chris, you're exactly right. A loopback connection or a loopback cable connection uh, will absolutely let you see, you know, hey, is this is this thing on? Hello? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Jordan, do you feel about cereal the way I do? I hate it. I despise it. <laughs> if, it does, yeah. if it doesn't have an IP address, then I really <laughs> don't want to touch it. Uh, next time I have a serial problem, I'm calling Chris Tobin. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're crazy for Coco Pop. <clears throat> great tip, though. A great tip. And I'm sure you can Google how to make a, a loopback connector for serial. Not a problem. Um, yeah, pin hey, and three. I've, oh, there, there you go. <laughs> Pretty easy. <laughs> I, I want to give my quick tip uh, of the week, and that is if you're not an SBE member, come on. Come on. Become an SBE member. Uh, it's a great value and um the, the fantastic leadership in the organization i was just on a conference call today i can't tell you what it was about but it was it, it just it points out what terrific leadership that we as broadcast engineers get to get to be part of with the society of broadcast engineers great organization and uh, if you want to learn something that you don't know about broadcast there's probably a webinar about it and uh uh SBE has got a huge collection of really in-depth webinars to, to, to get you, well, to help get you certified if that's your goal, uh, or just to get you informed if that's your goal. So sbe.org is the website. And I would highly encourage you to become a member if you're not already. And, um, by, and uh, as, as the headline here is, Jim Leifert was just elected as the new president of SBE. Uh, Jerry Massey has uh, served a couple-year term, and I really appreciate Jerry. Uh, we got to interview him a couple of years ago uh, from the national meeting, and I'm sure we'll get to talk to Jim Leifer as well. That's it for this edition of This Week in Radio Tech. I want to uh, thank Jordan Bits from Boise, Idaho, for joining us. Jordan, thanks uh, thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a it's like a bucket list item for any engineer to be on This Week in Radio Tech, <laughs> oh. and now oh, I get to cross kind. that off mine. <laughs> you're too well we'd love to have you back on again sometime i mean you know after you learn some more stuff you can be back on oh of course <laughs> <laughs> okay and chris tobin he's learned about everything there is to learn thanks for being here chris i appreciate it no problem and by the way if you just look over my shoulder there's doctor yeah. who that's it uh -huh. doctor who. you were talking with david bialik that's <clears throat> peter capaldi that's actually the audio on my sub at the moment <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have an amazing uh doctor who uh um uh uh, uh, uh I don't know what you call it. Audio is going to come from everywhere. Like, like, like a TARDIS, there'd be audio, the audio space is bigger than the, than the space is possible. It's so, just a bunch of sonic know. screwdrivers running around. I know. There you go. <laughs> sonic it's, a well, it's a well produced show. If you do listen to, if you watch the program, <laughs> if you enjoy sci fi and Doctor Who, listen, watch the show with headphones on. You would be amazed at what the BBC audio tracks, what they do in that show. Close your eyes, hmm. and you will hear things like, "Wait a minute, where is that in the scene?" In the scene, and just like, "Uh, can't find it." But it's the wildest thing. So Dave, David is correct. It's it, it's worth going to. And uh, the other cool. thing I'm worth going to at AES is Steve Lampin. I say this every time. Steve Lampin presentations are the best. You never know what yeah. they're going to be. Never two are alike. <laughs> I know. I know. He's amazing. It's, he is. He is. We ought, ought to have him back here. 
back here on, on the show. We had some technical troubles last time we had him on the show. We'll try to have him back again, though. Hey, I got to go. Jordan and uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Suncast for producing our show flawlessly, as usual. Appreciate it very much. And uh, thanks also to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, a home of lots of other fine podcasts, a few of them even technical in nature, um, and then others that are just really interesting. <laughs> Check them out. I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.